afternoon, um, our district, we are talking about our distal, district annual objectives action planning and Mrs. Michelle Whitney will direct this, will be <laughs> the substance of this study session. <laughs> Good evening, Board President Phillips, members of the board. It is my pleasure to be in front of you for a study session. I feel like it's been a while since I've done a study session with you. We are focused on our district annual objectives planning. So I brought for your consideration a draft of some action plans for all, I think there's five uh, of the district annual objectives. So the items that you see laid out in these action plans, again, are a springboard for the work that will, it, that will happen in order to meet the annual objective. So I wanted to get them in front of the board to seek any feedback or input that you had while they were still under development. Once I have some feedback and impact put from you, I'll integrate it into the action planning and then finalize these for you so that you know and understand the steps taken to meet each of the annual objectives. So the first annual objectives, and these are not being presented to you in any order of their importance or priority. They're just um, in order as, as developed. So the first was long-term facilities management plan refresh. So the board gave us direction to look at our long-term facilities management plan and do a refresh as a board in January of the year that was interrupted in March by COVID. So was that 20? Yeah, in January of 20, the board approved a bond for a comprehensive high school number three modernization of CTE spaces, land, et cetera, totaling about uh, right at $100 million. Based on the input or the disruption of COVID to the regular operations of the district and the impact to the community, the board directed staff to delay that bond. As we now have entered back into school, the board has given us direction to focus on long-term facilities management planning as soon as possible. So we are launching that as a district annual objective. So the board asked us to potentially integrate our new board advisory committee approach and use the language from the policies that you worked with Dr. Thomas Alsberry in developing and keeping our eye on high school boundaries as we plan for comprehensive high school number three. There's a lot of interest in ensuring that as we're planning for comprehensive high school number three, that boundaries are kept in mind, specifically in alignment to the feeder pattern that has been designated as important to our community. So you can see by way of action, uh, we need to start by defining our, the long-term facilities management planning committee purpose using, potentially using the new language that you just passed and really being clear and thoughtful about the purpose of that committee, what parameters do they have and what process do we want to use in engaging uh, community stakeholders, district staff, technical working group, et cetera. I plan to bring that conversation to you as a board on our next meeting during a study session and the deliverable from that particular meeting will be a community process for you as a board to take action on. And there's some artifacts with links there for you as a board should you choose to look into it. Then we recognize based on that conversation, it's going to trigger a number of events, including, um, well, Mr. Sital has already started exploring some consultative options to help us with things like enrollment projections, our GIS study, bond finance, and meeting facilitation, as well as starting to look at um, some doing some internal data analysis that will prepare us then for when you you take action on our final committee process to go ahead and implement and launch that process as early as December. So our goal would be to focus on the event or the activities that I just described between now and December to launch that process in December and then keep you updated throughout the process and bring a revised long-term facilities management plan to the board for your approval and action. So, and that would be to be determined based on the process that we develop. So I'm happy to take input on each plan as we go or wait till the end. I'll defer to Board President Phillips, however you'd like me to handle that. Um, what, what would the board like to do? Wait till the end. Okay, let's do that. So our next district annual objectives is the Voting Rights Act uh, regarding director districts. You'll notice on this, on this action plan 
there's a, a lot of work that's highlighted in gray. I use this as an opportunity to catalog all of the work that has been done starting in September of 2017. And each of the activities has a cataloged artifact that you can click on. It'll take you to the cover sheet, the PowerPoint presentation, et cetera. I thought it would be nice for the board's convenience to have all of the materials that are specific to this particular action plan in one place. It was quite a project to go back through all the board packets to find it. So I, I think you'll find this as a valuable resource. I know that Sarah and I both have already appreciated it. I also did highlight it in gray because I certainly didn't want to take credit for work done prior to the board identifying it as a district annual objective for staff this year. So you'll notice when we get to the pieces that are no longer highlighted um, in September, Sarah pr um, provided, or the board took action. Um, again, there's a, with a timeline with final action taking place no later than January 15th was direction we were given. And again, there's artifacts there. You can see where the new census data was released and then a series of study sessions and board reports resulting in the board taking action in December at the December 14th board meeting around the director districts. I do want to note that the timeline can be revised and you'll hear from Sarah probably may need to be revised um, if there's a sense that that we need some more time for stakeholder engagement and really at this point the need to make a revision to the timeline is based on when we get the new maps from the demographer and Sarah can provide you more information during the actual board meeting about that. So while this particular action plan seems really long, it's because it's cataloging all of the work done from 2017 to date around this particular action or district annual objective. The next one is definition of equity. I wanted to start by highlighting that even before the board identified this as a district annual objective, district staff had identified diversity, equity, and inclusion as a, as a focus. Last year, we worked with an outside consultative firm who did some focus groups with our students, and our students surfaced eight key priorities for us to focus on. Those priorities were used to develop the RFP, or the request for proposals, that was put out. The request for proposals is an artifact that's here, so you can see the, the request that went out was advertised. You can also see here, if you click bid recap, the people who gave us responses to that proposal, and then the rationale for selecting John Crownapple and Floyd Cobb. Their body of work is called Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity, and I think really aligns with our district's core value around every student having inherent worth and value, and it's our job to make sure that we're providing a program of study that helps each individual student get what they need. So based on the RFP, we've started a series of trainings with John Crownapple with the express purpose of building a common understanding and common language or what it, around what it means to be in and lead in a culture of dignity um, and creating belonging through that culture. So we started our first session in July with what's called leadership council. So that's your core district staff. There's probably 25 of us that represent the core departments. Um, at the district level, we did a training in January. These are the outcomes and you can see the materials there. We've had a principal training that was at our Leadership Academy in August that was very similar to the training that district staff went through in July. Again, the handout is there. We had an executive team meeting with John Crownapple in October where we focused on planning next steps, uh, focused on systems and how we measure belonging and started to talk about how we would um, develop a shared vision and, and agreements. Then our uh, John, John Crownapple came back and did a second session with our principals and leadership council just a couple weeks ago or six days ago, I guess, nine days ago, six days ago. And um, then you can see the, the rest of the schedule for John Crownapple's trainings. You see that there's a board study session there to be determined, we think it's important at some point when, um, when we're able to coordinate it and John Crownup will schedule for him to come and talk directly to you as a board, I think it's important that you hear directly from him about the philosophy that underpins a culture of belonging. We also have started to have some conversations around a long range plan that could include things like some piloting of data analysis and needs assessment at sites that are ready to, to, to launch that this spring and to engage in what are called empathy interviews with groups of students, parents, et cetera, as a way to do action planning at each individual building. 
our goal then this spring is to build out a long range plan from that, what we learn in some of those pilots to plan out what would year one, year two, and year three and beyond look like towards systemic implementation of a culture of belonging. I know uh, as a board, the district annual objective was round, was round a definition of equity and that as a board, you've given us direction to bring that to you for approval. So um, we'll know more toward the spring where we are with that and if we'll able, be able to deliver that equity definition in the spring or if it's something that we'll need more time to come to consensus around. The last, and again, not because it's the least important, it's just the last on the list, uh, is learning recovery. So as a board, you approved our OSPI learning recovery plan in May, and or we presented it to you in May, you approved it at the beginning of May, you approved it on May 25th. As a district staff right now, we're engaged with providing a data highlights for you about the how what student achievement looks like up against our outrageous outcomes. So you're getting a high level overview of the growth monitoring framework. For data for both 2019, 2020, 2020 and 2020-2021, those reports are scheduled. They started in October. They will work, run through December. Tonight you'll have the mathematics report. At the following meeting you'll have the cell report and then we'll um, kind of sweep up the last report with graduation before we uh, break for the winter break. Then when we come back from winter break, we'll start at the state of the school reviews where you'll get the building level presentations of the school improvement plans. We believe that this context is really important for you to have as board members before we launch study sessions in January focused more specifically on learning acceleration. The and we'll be able to give you data impacts because our students will have taken the, or are right now taking the S back this fall. So we'll have that data back and be able to do a deeper level of analysis about what the action plans will look like from the um, fall data through the end of the year. So again, we'll provide um, data about the 2020-21 school year uh, to, to the fall where we get that S back data back and then um, 21, and then, or the fall of 21, and then describe the key actions that we need to take around some areas of focus. You can see here listed already some extended learning opportunities. Um, we've, we've provided extended learning opportunities. We've engaged in narrowing the standards. We're exploring tutoring. PLC visits and common assessments are really key toward our focus in leveraging improvement for students Teachers are back in our buildings and engaging in those team meetings now. Those are critically important to us and were something that was suspended during COVID based on the complexity of, of educating students in a COVID environment. Um, we've been engaging in district and building level analysis and, and planning for meeting the cell needs of students. So that learning acceleration presentation will have a deeper detail on that piece in January and then, or at the beginning of January, then the end of January, we'll do a similar companion presentation, except this time focused on social emotional support. So again, data impacts from 2021 to the fall of 2021 and the key actions that we're taking based on that data. Um, you'll get a sense of some of this in the outrageous outcome report next meeting, but you'll um, be able to have a some of the artifacts would be the cell and mental health supports and again alice and um, our district learning behavior intervention specialists will be able to provide you some details around those key actions so with that that is the draft of the i keep losing count one two three four um, district annual objectives for this year. So I welcome any feedback and input to be integrated into the action planning and then happy to turn them over to district staff so they can continue the good work. I do have Sarah, Raul, Mira, and Carla who are all designated. So uh, Raul will be your point of contact for uh, the long-term facilities management planning. Sarah will continue with Voting Rights Act. Uh, Raul and I are the key contacts for definition of equity and Mira and Carla will be your key contacts for learning acceleration. So district staff is our assistant soups have also be assigned are assigned to one of the district annual objectives. So they're here.
to help answer any questions. Thank you. Talk about drinking from a fire hose. That <laughs> is a lot of information. So trying to keep up with it. Um, I appreciate the detail that's on this. Are there, look, well, let's go back. To, I'd like to go through these then individually. Yep. And so I want to go back to, we started with um, the Voting Rights Act. Acts, is that correct? Long-term facilities management. Long-term facilities plans, okay. Okay, long-term facility plan, yep, okay. And Voting Rights Act. So are there any questions, comments, or discussion on the Voting Rights Act? Or excuse me, <laughs> long-term facility management plan. Got a, I, I don't know if it's a question, a comment, um, exactly how to phrase this. So we've got four things up there. We've got the facilities plan, we've got voting rights, the voter districts, we've got equity, we've got learning and recovery. Um, how do you see your time being split between <laughs> these? Yeah, or, and I don't know that that's a fair question. I mean, I think we probably need to give you some direction, but if you were, if you were splitting it, what, what, uh, what do you think? So can you give me that in the form of a multiple choice answer? <laughs> Sorry, so I, I do not mean to put you on the spot. I am, I am. <laughs> so learning recovery, right? I mean, that to me, that's all of these are important. Mm -hmm. Voting Rights Act, we've we've started, uh, and I think the community the community input there that's probably going to be the biggest part of that. Is I mean, Sarah's going to put some time in there. Uh, your your role in that probably is limited, I would guess. That one, I think, is taking care of itself, but it's moving along. The only thing that, the big unknown there to me is going to be the number of community forums we have, the input and adjustments we have to make based on that. Kind of an unknown, but it's, but it's, uh, but I think we can put some parameters around it. Equity, the definition of equity, that one's being worked. The you know, that's, that's got a plan, it's scheduled there. Learning recovery, to me, that's huge. And, and that's, that's one we can't put off. I mean, it, and, um, and the facilities plan, to me, is critical, too. We've got, it, it, we can't put that one off either. So I'm no, just I, wondering, yeah, so what, I, what do we do here? <laughs> So I think that um, balancing work priority for district level staff, the superintendent and executive leadership is always a tentative balance. It's, you know, it's kind of like you feel like you're spinning plates a little bit, but we did design it such that I think you'll see that, you know, as some of the response, so like as Voters Rights Act is kind of coming to closure, right, that's gonna need to be acted on by January. That's then when we're in front of you talking about learning and acceleration. So I think that you have to kind of have this visual that it's like a runway, so we're starting this runway as this, as this plane is launching. Yeah. So that's kind of how the work priority for us um, is. And I, I will say that right now, for me as superintendent, a lot of my time has been being focused on it, and I have a lot of help with both Carla and Mira, but the outrageous outcome progress monitoring reports are an enormous task. There's lots of hours for me on that, and then I do a lot of work, and then the hours that Carla and Mira and their teams are spending is pretty significant, and I think in some ways more significant than I anticipated it being. So, you know, I know we made some commitments around that to get through this cycle. I think at some point that would be a good thing for us to talk about is if that's meeting your needs, does it have to be so robust, et cetera. Um, so at, I, at this I, point, stop you that's a, a huge... I think that's key. Does it have to be so robust? Um, I'm, I honestly, this, like Steve said, the learning recovery is huge. We, you know, looking through those, those numbers that we got last week were really critical and it was really great having those numbers. What was positive is it seemed like we went back about two years in our growth. 
I think that's impressive, honestly, for everything that we have done to only go back two years. But we were going forward at a, at a significant rate, and mm -hmm. to go back two years is, years is hard. Mm -hmm. But it is critical to get these kids back on track. Um, you know, subbing in the schools and things, teachers are constantly complaining about these kids don't, they just are, this is the lowest group that they have ever had in these various, um, especially these kids that are in, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they just haven't, you know, be, not being in school is critical. Mm -hmm. So I think what Steve said was, was, was great. And, and if you, I don't think getting through this cycle is, is um, might not be necessary to simplify some of our outrageous outcomes. So I do want you to think about this. Okay. At the back of your mind, I think it's critical that that, that learning recovery is first, always first, um, rather than ra rather than almost anything else. Um, we we've got to get our kids back up to. So anyway, right. can you can finish? Sure. I think it's important for us as staff what what those board progress monitoring reports are doing is the data analysis from 1920 and 2021. That's important for us to understand to make sure that the decisions we're making around learning recovery are based in our current reality. So I think it's important that we're doing the work we're doing. I think it's that balance of how much is, it, is too much in terms of what we're providing you. Like I think one of the reports was 19 pages. You know, yeah. I think that has always been an area of, I'm going to say weakness for me as a superintendent. Like if I can make it hard, I'm going to make it hard. <laughs> so it's, you know, we just need to find the right balance of what's the right kind of green size of information to be giving you. So I don't think I answered your question, Steve. I guess the, the answer is that managing work priority for executive level leadership of an organization this size is just kind of a constant balance and a, a bit like spinning plates. Uh, and I, I wasn't looking for a specific answer, Michelle. I think <laughs> that's so glad. that kind of points out what I was trying to get at. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work and, um, and I mean, ideally, we would have one district annual objective, and I mean, I don't know. Maybe some of this is your regular work that you that you do on an ongoing basis, but but um, I, I'm just concerned that we've we I say we we've identified these as a board these annual objectives, and that we've given you a lot of work, and it's um, how do we make it work so sure. that it, we're successful in all of them because they're all important. And, and if we can simplify any one of these, um, there's a great deal of work that goes into all of these. Are all of those steps necessary? You know, we had some incredible work done with our facilities management plan. We loved that, that 20 year bomb package. We are redefining that a little bit, you know, and if we need to redefine that a little later, we could also do that. But, but you know, I think our primary focus was the bond. And so keeping that in mind, okay, how much of this do we have to do right now? Um, you know, you have a wonderful flow chart, chart for the budget and how to keep the budget focused on student achievement. Mm -hmm. And I really love that because, because it is so easy to, to get hyper-focused in an area and forget the big picture. Yeah. And so, you know, just, just a reminder that, you know, you know recovering these, the, the learning that has been lost and helping our kids to, to both socially and emotional learning is critical because they're not going to succeed in school if they are not um, if they're not doing well in, in life. So th those things that will really, ha really help propel our kids forward into their futures is, is critical. So remembering that all of this is, is about the kids and, and making sure that that's the focus and simplifying other things. That's great, thank you. Is there anything else? I guess. I just summarize with, I think everyone's saying the same thing, right? We've prioritized as a board that student achievement is number one. And while the most direct route to student achievement, the quickest one there is the accelerations and, and that one there, but everything on there in a way contributes to student achievement, right? It, if we were to talk about and go back to the bond, you know, people have said we have the largest 4A high school in the state, we have the largest 3A high school in the state. There's not a, there may not be as many opportunities for students at very large schools like that, so which then leads to are there as many opportunities at the academic level as well. So all of it, each one of these indirectly points towards student achievement, which I think 
we've shown as a board in the last number of years that student achievement's number one. So if we keep that in mind, I think we're successful, successful no matter what. Thank you, Scott. I think one of the things I want to point out too, and I think this is impressive, leadership from the board is the interconnectedness, and I think you're saying the same thing, Scott, the interconnectedness of these, these five annual objectives. So um, tonight during the actual board meeting, our student advisory council members are going to talk to you about our last superintendent student advisory council meeting. And one of the things we talked about is the social, emotional health and, health and well-being of our students. And what surfaced during their conversation is, and they use the word belonging, students needing to feel like they belong, students feeling like they don't belong. That's the heart of the district or the DEI work that we're doing with John Crown Apple is this concept of belonging. And so, you know, I think as a district leader, when board leadership, what student leadership is saying and what district staff is working on aligns that way, I think you've I just think that's impressive and as someone who values systems it's always like I get kind of goosebumpy when those it's like a big game of Tetris and when those things come together you know that you're you're focused on the right work so while it is an enormous body of work and a complicated body of work if you were to ask me which one of these should we set aside I don't think I could say well we need to set this one aside because they are so interconnected and I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna pat all of us on the back a little bit to say that that doesn't happen by accident you know, it's not like we stumbled around and chose these five things and they all happen to connect. That's very specific and intentional and steadfast leadership over a number of years that got us to the place where these five things connect and align with what students are asking us for. You're saying five is, do we miss one? Oh, I don't know, there's probably four, I'm sorry. There's is there only four? I, there's I, four. I remember I'm five sorry. at one time, but maybe it was. I added one. No, I just That's went through and counted them. I'm like, five, I have four down here. I keep counting them and saying five, but I think there's only four. <laughs> Well, I this think is at one wonderful. Time it was five, but one maybe, of our but primary things know. with the facility management plan is is the bond. And um, when when do you think that that bond or a rough draft or something something we can take to the community? When do you think that will be ready? I couldn't really find this. In yeah. The so it's a great question, Amy. And I'm going to say this: it's really dependent on what it is that you as a board ask us to do. If you ask us just to dust off and push back the bonds that are already planned. The timeline by which we could deliver that to you in the community is vastly different than if you come back to us and say our circumstances are so different that we need you to rework the whole plan i'm not going to be able to deliver that to you in six months nine months i mean that like a complete rework of the plan is a is a you know nine to 18 month situation if we're dusting it off and doing a little refresh then a shorter timeline would be more reasonable um, so it's going to be really dependent on, on what your direction to district staff is on the 9th when I, when I come to ask you what you'd like us to do. On the 9th of November? November. So I'll be back in front of okay. you just in two weeks to have that conversation. Perfect. That, yeah. that, so that sounds great because the sooner the better, and I think that's a really important question. Would this, so would this have to do with that um, permanent um, committee that the board has that has in place? Is that the part that would be very difficult along with the bond? So any committee process, so it, when you start to engage stakeholders and committee processes, et cetera, take time to build consensus. So it's really about the, how narrow or broad the focus of that committee's work is. The more narrow the committee's work is, the faster and more agile and nimble you can be. The broader the focus, the more things to come to consensus on, you know, the more time that takes. And so um, I don't necessarily think it's the, the the policy that that is going to take us quote unquote more time it's groups of people working on really big projects takes a lot of time if you want to do it right well and build consensus groups of people focused on narrow projects takes less time especially again if you want to build consensus so i just i think it comes down to what it is that you want us to do and how you want the community or the committees to be involved and what kind of level of leadership and engagement you want them to have Okay, thank you. So you talked about refresh versus re redoing it. Right. What what would be a refresh? Basically, we just extend what we've got out two years or whatever the time frame is. Oh, yeah, or a variation of. So you gave us direction in January before. So I, that was 2020, right? January of 2020, 2020 yeah. to run a comprehensive high school modernization of CTE. You know, if that, if we just want to confirm that that's still the right thing to do you know 
we'll need to update some numbers, look at our enrollment growth, look at our GIS study, and just confirm that that's the right work, then that's kind of a refresh, right? You're dusting it off, you're confirming. If it's not, where do we need to tweak it a little bit? If you're wanting us to go back to the drawing board and re-decide the, the bond cycles, re-decide the, the amount of the bonds, you know, redo capacity calculations, et cetera, then that's a much, that's a much different task. And that is what we will be talking about in two weeks Correct. in the study session. Correct. So Correct. we can have a, probably a little deeper discussion then. But Correct. I can tell you from my perspective right here, and I don't want to have the discussion tonight because we've got, we'll have it then. But, but um, I think things have changed. Yeah. And we've done, so your long, the long-term facilities management plan that you approved, um, I think in March, it, it, the, the first thing we brought to you was a capacity analysis up against enrollment projections. I've asked, and Kevin Hebden did that work. I think he'd been working here like four minutes and he did that work for us. I had him redo it with no bonds. Like, so it just shows if there is no more additional building, what is the capacity and enrollment analysis? And so I'll have some data to at least bring to you to start that conversation. Um, so know that, know that it won't be just kind of a, a, a conversation from, with nothing to, to back up or, or to provide context for the discussion. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and our assessed value is changing considerably. Correct. So I think Correct. those are those are things that are gonna impact that plan. And Correct. So, but we can talk about that next week, I guess, or next meeting. Correct. I know the difficult part is the overcrowding that we're experiencing in the high schools now. You know, we need a high school you know, tomorrow, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, we, not, we not needed it in, but you know, I mean, I wanna, we were in such a good trajectory with yeah. that, that decision. People were excited about it. We were engaged in the high school planning, like the student board reps were excited about the high school. I mean, we were, had such a nice cadence to that project and those decisions. And there were lots of things that were heartbreaking and have been heartbreaking about COVID. And to see the enthusiasm behind that um, and have to put a push pin in that was, was difficult yeah. okay so we have the facilities management plan that we talked about um, are, is there anything else that anyone wants to talk about with that let's move on to the voting rights act does anybody have any questions about the voting rights act work no I think we've recently talked about this one and so we might all be you know the one thing that I thought that I really like what you did with this voting rights act work and linking it to all of these different um, cover sheets, PowerPoint presentations. Is there any way, this has been something that I've, at least I've been asked about quite a bit by the public. Is there any way to put, because a lot of people are like, back in 2013, you know, we asked you to do this. And I'm like, no, 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 it wasn't 2013. Right. <laughs> and, um, and so I think, I, I love this timeline. I love this work. Is there any way to post that? onto our, our website sure. for, because I think that might be really, really valuable. Sure, absolutely. Just the Voting Rights Act. I Listen mean, you've sure, already absolutely. done all this work <laughs> and links. Shane can totally post that to the website. <laughs> so Yeah, no, it's great. Anyway, I really appreciate that too. It looks like a great deal of work and, and I, I, I just went through these dates and I'm like, oh my goodness, yeah, I, uh, perfect. I need that date in my head. So thank you for doing yeah, this. No, my pleasure. Um, so Sarah, let's I think Sarah had something she wanted to yes. ask. Okay, great, thank you. Um, moving on to the definition of equity. Do we have any questions from the board about the definition of equity? And how are, it looks like more of a definition of belonging, <laughs> but it all ties back into the equity piece. Um, Superintendent Whitney, when we first kind of went into this definition of equity that when the board did this, oh, I think it was a couple of years ago, the board was a little disenfranchised by um, 
by feeling like we didn't have a voice in what was going on um, with the presenter presenters that had come in, that it was more like, you know, a lecture rather than a discussion. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we are all very on board with, with um, turning this over to committee. This is actually a lot bigger work, but it also fulfills the requirement of the new law that we must teach this. So I do want to be really careful that we reflect the community's values in this. And is that happening? At this point, it's not, because as a district staff, we're learning together and creating a common understanding in language. At the part of the long-term plan will be exactly that. How do stakeholders beyond district staff and principals, how do they get involved and engaged around this learning? So we just are, we're learning a whole new vocabulary, a whole new philosophy, a whole new way of interacting with this information. And so we wanted to be really mindful of kind of creating this space or this container to have these conversations in a way that, that we all understand what we mean when we say belonging. So yet, not yet is the answer to your question and that will be part of the long range planning is what would we expect for different stakeholder groups in year one, year two, year three, and beyond. You, you have to excuse my ignorance. What's the, what's the law that we teach right now? So the, um, what is it? The uh, Senate Bill 5044 requires that we provide diversity, equity, and inclusion training as board members, but then also as district that we're providing it. It, and it has a metric or there's a rubric um, identified. Staff. It's just staff. staff. Staff and board it's members. It's not for education. Not for kids. Okay. No. Thank you. You know, one of my concerns is I saw some training that was posted online from a neighboring district, and it was a little bit disturbing with some of the things that were, that, that had happened. Um, I, I want to stay away from that. Um, some of the videos that I watched that were linked to that were, were quite disturbing where it basically, I feel like it said, you, you can no longer have a, an opinion on this. You know, I believe in peaceful protest. I don't believe in some of those other things, and yet in that it said that I had no right to, to have that belief. There, there were things like that that I don't want to be taught in our, in our schools. We all have the right to have beliefs, and we have the right to have those beliefs um, respected even if we don't agree with one another and those beliefs and I don't want to teach our teachers that you have to think this way so that that is a major concern to me um, and because of our experience in that one that we that I think all five board members were a bit frustrated with um, I, I want to make sure that that isn't happening how do you feel about that? And would you be opposed to having a board member sit in on some of those trainings? I am absolutely not opposed to you as board members sitting in on the trainings. I'd be happy to get you the book. Um, John Crownapple was chosen specifically for his philosophy in, in underpinnings around this work. And it's, it is all hinges around the concept of belonging, which says I can show up just as I am and be my contribution to influence matters just as much as anyone else's and that each and every person that's associated with our organization needs to feel that every day. Now the truth is some don't and our kids will tell you that, that there are students who don't feel like they belong. So that's where an empathy interview comes in. Help me understand how we can help you belong. How can we help you feel like on a daily basis you can show up just as you are and your contribution and influence matters just as much as anyone else's. But I think John Crownapple's philosophy and approach to the work resonated for all of us We've gotten really positive feedback from our principals around it. We, our transportation director wanted to buy the book and do a book study with all the bus drivers. Like everyone who's coming interfaced with the content has resonated with it and been very enthusiastic about taking it back with the groups that they, they serve to do deeper work with it. We've actually had to kind of hold people off to say, now wait a minute, we need to make sure we're speaking with one voice and we all really collectively understand what we're committing to and what we're talking about. So we're being very thoughtful and methodical and in some ways slow in the way that we're doing this work and walking shoulder to shoulder with the consultant who has experience doing this across the country. He, uh, he's on the East Coast, so it's not uncommon, or and he travels all over, like one time he was in Hawaii. So he, because they're ahead of us, he got up like early and he did two hours with us before he went to a school that day. I mean, he's just incredible, his commitment to helping walk um, districts through. He does say we're his favorite, just so you know. He, 
Um, but no, I'm more than, you're more than welcome. We can make sure that you get invited the next time. Um, and we're happy to get you the book. I mean, the book's an easy read. It's, it's very straightforward, I think. And I've sat down with people, our community members, who've been concerned about different aspects of, of the political environment around diversity, equity, and inclusion recently. And I've taken this book with me and I've given it to them and said, this is what we're focused on. Give it a read. Call me if we need to talk about pieces. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping they're reading the book and I've yet to have anyone call me with concerns, but it, you know, it, people, everyone I've given the book to, it, it has resonated with them. So, and, not to, and that's not to mean we won't have bumps along the way as we implement this, as we have conversations, there will absolutely be bumps in tension at different points. The goal of this work is for us to have common language, common commitments about how we'll interact as we move through this and learn together. So. Thank you. Yeah. Can you do a couple of things for me then, can, or for us? Mm -hmm. Can you extend an invitation to the board and then have us accept when we get two people, then we'll call it enough? Sure. And if the, none of the board wants to participate, it's not a requirement. Does that work for the rest of the board? Yeah, uh, yeah I, and I've, I've had some the same concerns that Amy's expressed here. I, I don't, um, I would ask, is there a way that we could get like a a presentation in a board meeting just about the principles that he's teaching and working on. And I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know if you can boil it down into something that succinct, but. Oh no, he, but, I've already, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But I would rather do that sooner rather than later okay. because of the experience we had last time. I, I just, uh, I, I did not feel like the approach last time was, was uplifting. If no. For lack of a better term, I felt it was, uh, I felt there was a better approach. And so I'm curious to how this one is, and, and, and this is important to at least me as a board member, and I think as a board, we've identified this as a priority. So before, before, and I'm sure it's okay, but I would just before it gets too far. No, it's great. We, um, next year, I'd like to see what, what we're getting. So from the other board members, in order to do that, we need at least three board members. How do the other board members feel? Okay, I, I agree. So there's four board members that would love to have a presentation on that, if you can fit that in yeah. anytime in the next few months. As well as, um, I mean, we'd love to hear directly from him, but if we can't, you know, maybe even a clip or something of him would be, would be great. If, but we're fine hearing from you as well, because I know he, that can be expensive and we don't want to do that. I mentioned it to him to do a board study session or a board interaction with you when we met with him on the 5th, and he was completely open to that. It'll just be a matter of coordinating schedules. I'm not sure that we'll get him here in person in a way that coordinates schedules, but he makes things work virtually all the time. I mean, if he can be here in person, that would be ideal, but at the minimum, we could do something virtually. And he, I mean, I've seen him present for 45 minutes. I've seen him present for an hour. I've seen him present him for the whole day. So he can yeah, tailor be his presentation session. for you. Yeah, I think, I think a study session, yeah. study yeah. session would be great. Yeah. And yeah. virtually is fine with me. Yeah. I mean, I think that might be easier. So okay. I think it would work. Um, so thank you, I appreciate yeah. that. So having a study session I think is a great idea, Steve. I, inviting us to those would be great if you can do that. And the last thing is, I think it would be really valuable for the whole board. I've already purchased the book and read part of it, but I think it would be really valuable for, I would love a hard copy. Um, I have a Kindle copy. So um, if you could, can, can you provide that book for the board? Absolutely. Could you provide that book for our um, board representatives as Absolutely. well? Okay, thank you. That I might even one. have enough copies I've been buying them like hotcakes, so I give them to everyone. Perfect. Books for everyone. Yeah. Thank so you. I you may even have some. So I yes. think our youth would enjoy enjoy that too, and maybe they can even present some of those. You know, whatever they might be helpful to student councils. They might not be, but are there any other um, de definition of equity? Any other comments on that? Okay. Let's move on to learning recovery. So one, just real quick before we leave this, I think I just want to provide a little bit of a, so as we learn about this together, as it is really a cultural shift, it, so I just, I don't, so we may be envisioning like a definition of equity on a piece of paper, like it may be more global than that. So just, we'll, we'll keep you informed about how that's all gonna look, but it may be more comprehensive than just a single definition of equity. Okay. Which I think is what, at least from my perspective, that's what we want. We want people to feel included. That, I, I think that's the whole goal of diversity, equity, and inclusion is find out how people fit so that they don't feel like they're outside the, 
outside the group. And I, so I don't know that it's going to be a definition on paper. So I think right. this, this sounds like what we're looking for, at least what I'm looking for. So. But it is a philosophy that we would like to use to vet against our policies, our curriculum, sure. everything, to make 100%. sure that we're doing what's best for our students. Absolutely. So, yeah, something that will work for that. Anything else? Okay, learning, recovery, and PLCs. Or not PLCs, sorry. My question was on PLCs. That's what I have on my paper. So, <laughs> learning, recovery. Anything about learning and recovery? Any questions there? So you, you, I think you brought up in your presentation that we need to get the uh, we need to get the scope right so that we're getting valuable information, not just making work. Right. Did you have some ideas on where we could make some changes to that to make it more efficient and more effective on our board progress monitoring yeah. reports? Especially, so, I mean, our board progress monitoring is continuous. I mean, that's the goal there is that that goes on long term. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this learning acceleration as, as short term. This is, this is COVID recovery. We, we figure out what we need to do, where we've gone backwards, and what kind of things we can do in the next year or two while we have funding to get these students back up on grade level. Or, or as close to it as we can, recover as much as we can. So, so I'm looking at these somewhat differently. Mm. Whether I'm right or wrong, I don't know. So I'm, I'm looking for input from you, but I, I think uh, whatever we can do to learn that as quickly as we can, I say we, not necessarily as a board, but as a district, to learn where we need to, to direct resources and what resources to direct and how to direct them, I think that's that should be the priority for this one from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So learning acceleration and learning recovery while exacerbated during COVID is not a new phenomena to our district. And I think Scott pointed that out at our last meeting. We engage in s systemic analysis of student data all the time in our PLCs, students are, are Teachers are doing common formative assessments, they're adjusting instruction, they're providing intervention. You know, we analyze student data to invite students to summer school opportunities, et cetera. So it's not completely a new concept for us. The scope of how many students need it maybe is different. Um, the equity tool that we use to analyze our data as recorded by ORSPI, that level of granular specificity, the equity tool using an equity tool was new for us and I think hugely beneficial and a practice will continue. Um, and so they're all kind of tangled together. I do think, you're right Steve, that there's things that we're going to be able to do in this next couple of years because we have ESSER funds that are going to be different than what we'll do in the long term, but I do think this is a long term game for us. Like recovering from COVID or recovering from the impacts of this environment it's going to be a three to five, seven year journey. Like we're not even through it yet. Students are still hugely impacted on the day at school. And again, you know, I mentioned it before, our students can speak to this. The social emotional needs of our students right now, the amount of anxiety kids have is, is pretty palpable when you go to school. And it's one of the things that our student advisory, like our student council board wants to talk about. So, um, you know, in the short term, because we have ESSER funds, we're looking at some innovative practices around tutoring. Um, one, a school district on the west side is providing or is looking at kind of a, uh, we have an employee assistance team where every employee has access to a number of counseling sessions free of charge. Um, they have a similar program in a west side school that's for students. They get access free of charge to families for X number of teletherapy appointments. So those are some of the innovative kind of, um, I, I want to kind of like, I'm going to say triage kinds of pieces that we want to add into the system while we have the benefit of enhanced funding as we then, you know, get on top of exactly what is the longer range system going to need to be. So it's going to be kind of a layered approach, much like what you just described. Do we, do we have a team? So I'm, I'm looking at, and we'll get to it tonight. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, and we, we saw it in our last um, 
outrageous outcomes, our last report on academics, and then tonight we're going to talk about math. And as we look through it, we'll see spots where certain student groups were impacted or appear to be impacted a lot more than other student groups. And we have to be quick and nimble, right, with the, with the COVID funds because they're only for two years. And in our reports right now, we don't really see like, okay, here's that big impact to this student group. Here's what we're gonna do. Is, can we use COVID money for that? Is there a team that, that looks at that or are we looking on just, and I heard you say it, it's a, a layered approach or, you know, but how, how nimble are we? Can we look at that data and go, we, we have this hired pool of staff, including teachers that we can deploy to help these students, you know, within the next couple months or is it, well, we'd have to go hire teachers and that takes six months and then, you know, by the time we get to it, the groups will have changed that need the help or are we hiring, are we hiring staff and students and edu or sorry, staff and educators right now that know that they're funded by COVID money that may run out in two years? So the staff that we've hired, Carla or Mira, did you want to jump in here anywhere? The, the staff that we've hired with COVID money to this point have been to operationalize being in school, contact tracing, care rooms, et cetera, et cetera. We do have people who are doing, and I'll let Carla or, and or Mira talk to more of the academic intervention pieces. I think the piece that when you ask, can we be nimble, having the ESSER funds allows us to be more nimble. So things like tutoring that's, you know, contracted out to a third party potentially. This idea of, you know, additional counseling beyond what we can provide. So, you know, we have all of the regular supports that we've always had, but when you're trying to close gaps, you have to do a layered approach on top of that. So I think those are the pieces where we can be nimble, Scott, because we have the ESSER funds. So, so and I guess I'm thinking more programmatically, yeah. if we wanted to go hire teachers for two years, what, what administrative hurdles do we have either with the with union, with hiring practice, with other things that can we go and hire teachers to, you know, assist and, and do these programs, understanding that they won't be going into the pool for longevity, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can get certificated educators working on this in higher numbers as well. The only barrier to that concept are people who are willing to apply. People who are willing to? The hiring pools. That would be the only barrier. Because those There's are finding teachers right now. Finding teachers. Because in two years, there'll probably be openings anyway within the school system. But being able to find teachers, period. So just a point of answer. clarification on acceleration. While tutoring would be one of the models in acceleration, and again, that's some of the work that we're gonna be doing with our principals is narrowing the focus for acceleration because there's a variety of strategies to select from. And then we can pool our resources when we all agree to use some of the same ones. So tutoring would, re would could potentially be the classroom teacher or additional staff. However, that isn't necessarily the focus of hiring more people because when you're looking at acceleration, it really is a shift in philosophy and a focus on standards and immediate skills that kids need to access grade level standards. So we're in the past, a more traditional approach would have been in looking at all the gaps that kids had and you provide interventions on all of those gaps in order by like grade level. Okay, they have first grade gaps, second grade gaps, and you kind of plug those holes and go along. Acceleration is different in that you look at those grade level standards and you only fill the gaps that are tied to that specific standard or learning target in mathematics. So for example, um, ninth grade algebra, you're not gonna go back and fill a gap how you maybe traditionally would have if a child is missing a second grade standard. You're only looking at the specific skills so that kids can attach that standard and learn that standard immediately. So that's kind of a difference in approach. And with that, it's some training for our teachers. It's some lesson planning, additional time, and looking at the specific standards, how they, the scope and sequence and which ones to focus on because we're kind of, you're not really doing the traditional model of, of filling all of the gaps that kids have in the more of a re remediation approach. You're looking at acceleration so kids can access those grade level standards so you're not widening the gaps every year. So that's a very... So I, I don't fully understand version. everything you just said. I mean, in my mind, that still says, right, traditionally, and I understand this is not totally traditionally, but from our data, we can see there are groups of kids who need 
accelerations or remediations or whatever we want to call it that w could be broken out into a smaller group at the schools and have a educator professional helping them fill in their gaps is that does that not require additional teachers does that just require training our current teachers and if it does require additional teachers i'm saying how can we be quick and nimble and and hire these teachers because i do know there are teachers i've talked to that are ready to help do that kind of stuff even though they might not be filling the substitute pools so there's a lot of complexities around looking at standards and i think that you know in educational pedagogy that we can get into i think when we I think we do have a report planned for the board on acceleration to get into the details of that, that work. So there's a variety of things that can be done. And again, I think that's the work that we're gonna do with our principals to continue to narrow that focus. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And here, here's a, I, I'm sorry, it's hard for me not to get into the weeds with some of this, so I'm gonna apologize right now, partly because it's my world. So um, PLCs are tough. I have been at several schools that have done PLCs, and some do them well and some don't, and most do them sporadically. Um, at this point in time, it's critical that we do these well, because those have been proven again and again to really accelerate um, student achievement, especially in our kids that need it the most. And so I, I think it's critical. What I think we're coming up against, though, is substitute teaching shortage. It is really, really difficult for teachers to want to really engage in, P in PLCs when they have so little planning time because they've had to cover for other teachers. So that's a difficult thing too. I really, really appreciate your very innovative way of trying to handle some of these substitute teaching shortages that um, I don't even know if I'm, anyway, that, that, because we had a group of teachers, oh, probably 100 teachers that wrote the board th today and, and said, hey, we need help. We, we are swamped with this. And, and I did not know that, that one of, the, one of the solutions to that, can I share the solution? Yeah. One of the solutions to that was to hire teachers to be substitute teachers. Hire teachers, give them full salary pay, which is considerably higher, probably 40% higher than regular pay. And I'm guessing if they're past teachers that come on board as a substitute teacher, they would get the pay that they, is that correct? That they, whatever level that they're at. So anyway, I think that is a fantastic solution that will help, help this problem. But I do want to be aware that, that it, I just want, I want our schools, our principals, all of them to be aware that PLCs are critical. We don't want to give up that time that will really help our kids, um, that help our students' student achievement because we don't have enough planning time. So all we can do with this substitute teaching um, shortage w would be extremely helpful. Is that something we're considering? I mean, I feel like I've been beating this drum for years, but is that something we're considering is hiring a pool of whatever, 10, 10 permanent teachers that can be deployed around the district and, and paid at normal salary Yeah, this rates? is a fairly new development, Scott. You've got an email in your inbox today about okay. a solution, so. Okay. I've had that idea for quite a while as well, so I fully, I fully support it if, if we can pull it off. I Finally appreciate the district you, doing Board that. Board Member Learman. And I would like to reiterate that we, that we really reiterate to these schools and whatever that the importance of PLCs, that, that they're going to be critical to helping this learning. You know, you, you mentioned it's not like we're already through this crisis, no. trying to gain these learning losses when we're still in a crisis, when we still have social emotional needs, when we still have a lack of teachers, when we still have kids that are out and quarantined and all of these things. It's an uphill battle, and we are aware that we are in the middle of the crisis. And I still think we, that I still appreciate the fact that our district is being proactive, even though we're in the middle of a crisis. Thank you. I, I, you know, it's not lost on me that the last data I saw with COVID cases in August and September was like 500 and 469 student cases in August and September. You know, and those, that means those kids are out, you know, five, 10, however many days. And so, you know, there's, as you're trying to do the work that Carla described that is complex and students are in and out and you know so again we're not going to wait until our environment is quote unquote back to normal there's things we can do now it's just that awareness that it's still an extraordinarily complicated environment that we're all working on and it's making 
you know, um, I saw a, a tweet from a teacher that said, you know, little things are big things. It's like, you know, the little things that you used to take for granted are just so much harder in this environment, so. Yeah, I taught um, fifth grade yesterday, and I, there were seven kids out of 26 missing. That's right. So it's not just COVID. Yeah. They can't come to school if they have a cold. Right. They can't come to school if they have a sore throat. Yeah. So it is just really, it, it is really hard to keep, keep that continuation of learning when you're missing, you know, seven out of 26 kids. So just one last, are we done on this section? Or <clears throat> you weren't, before you move on. So I would just say, from my perspective, if there's things that you feel like you're doing that's just administrative work for the board that's impacting your, your progress and success in this learning acceleration, that please talk to us about it so that, we're, so that we can make the whatever needed adjustments so that you can be successful. Thank you, Steve, I appreciate that. All right, it looks like we're to the end of this discussion. Is there anything else that anyone would like to add? Um, what about our board reps? This was a lot of information for us, and we've been around for a long time. And, you know, all of those acronyms that they use sometimes drive us all crazy, but we, we've learned them. Do you have any questions, um, Jason or Brooke, to, for Mrs. Whitney, or any comments or suggestions? As of right now, I don't have any questions, but based off of the most recent conversation we had in the study session, um, I just agree with a lot of what's being said from a student perspective. It really shows. Um, I, both of my parents are teachers, so I might be a little bit more observant of certain things, but it really does show that it's taking a toll on a lot of the s teachers within our schools having to use every single one of their planning periods to sub a class and it, it impacts the students because we want to make connections with our teachers and that's something that is often forgotten we want to make connections with our teachers we want to learn and so it's just a little hard when people are tired and that's understandable but it is still an issue so i have nothing to add sorry <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks jason Thanks for being here. We really appreciate your input. Um, thank you, Mrs. Whitney. This was a great presentation. We appreciate the work that's being done in the district. I, uh, you know, going through these district annual objectives has reiterated at least to me that, the, that we're on a really good path forward on, in achieving our goals with our students. So thank you for thank you. your work. My pleasure. And we will reconvene at 6.30 for the regular board meeting. Thank you.